Hello, Jose. You are down in Brazil. Thank you for joining us. Hi there. Thanks for calling. It's great to talk to you guys. Oh, you have no idea how happy I am to have you with us because um, I found out about you. I got this email. An email was forwarded to me and I went, what the? And <laughs> I, will, I will read the email. It said, attention dive shops and dive businesses in general. Divers for Sharks is launching the declaration of the dive industry on marine conservation, which we intend to take to governments and international treaties around the world, highlighting the socio-economic importance of protecting the marine, marine environment for diving. Please read the text link, and if you agree to join, just send us your company name, your email, and, and your name to you, and thank you very much. And I'm just like, who is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, basically, we're, uh, we're a few people down here in the backwaters of Brazil trying to make a difference for marine conservation. Uh, I've been working in uh, marine conservation issues for 37 years now, since I was 15, when I first joined the fight against whaling in Brazil. Uh, I'm a, a late diver. I started diving when I was 36, and then uh, I, I couldn't stop anymore. And um, other than working in uh, Wales, I discovered all this whole other realm of uh, marine conservation challenges, uh, which are directly related to diving. And uh, in the end, uh, you know, nowadays, most of my activism is directed towards divers for sharks. And so, but you, you're involved in a whole bunch of things. You, you wear a ton of hats. Uh, yep. So you, so you run this, this um, the consulting uh, firm down in Brazil. But you're you're also involved in the dive industry, and just just explain all this because I can't believe all the things you're involved in. Yeah, well, um, you know, we 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 don't have a, a big structured NGOs with funding and staff and budgets here. So what most of what we do is a volunteer work, like in divers for sharks. It's all volunteer, and um, I have this little consulting firm on uh, environmental issues that works with uh, some dive companies. Uh, on developing their own environmental portfolios. Uh, one such company that I got involved with is uh, Manta Ray Bay Resort and Yap Divers in uh, Yap and Federated States of Micronesia, where we have this great guy, Bill Acker, who's a pioneer both for diving and conservation here. They pulled out the first Manta Ray Sanctuary in the world in 2008. And uh, I, I'd been there around that time and uh, really got mesmerized by what they do and ended up being their environmental ambassador around the world. Uh, so I work with Manta Ray in uh, different things. We're now trying to uh, put together a proposal to turn the whole island of Yap into a World Heritage Site, not only because of the mantas, but also their fantastic coral lagoon, uh, biggest colony of mandarin fish in the world, and uh, several other features. Um, in the end, I also work with uh, a local NGO here called the Augusto Carneiro Institute, named after one of the first uh, environmental activist pioneers in Brazil from the 60s and um, that that's the way it is we have to wear different hats to different things I used to be Brazilian uh, alternate commissioner to the whaling commission uh, for about 20 years uh, I also go to uh, different uh, conventions on uh, protected areas like the World Parks Congress last year where we also had a little side event on the dive industry together with a project to wear Australia so um, that's the way we have to do things around here. Not much time, not much money. But you're you're doing a lot. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's quite amazing. Just as as Margaret Mead says, you know, just just need a few a few uh, a group of, of of people, a small group of people, and that's how things happen. And and yeah, well, I'm I'm convinced of that. You know, it's people that make a difference. You can have these big structures, uh, big groups. Uh, that's fine. But in the end. It's the individual initiative that makes a real difference in conservation. Well, how did you start even thinking about doing this dive industry declaration? Where did this all come from? Well, it, it really came out of my experience uh, with whales. You know, uh, the, the whaling scene globally is plagued by uh, vote buying. You know, big whaling countries buying votes of uh, small port, fragile uh, developing countries. And it happened in Latin America for many years. And the way that we got countries in a region out of the waiting block was by explaining to uh, 
politicians, decision makers, stakeholders, the importance of the non-lethal use of whales through whale watching and uh, non-lethal research and the way that that provides uh, jobs and income for coastal communities. In that way, we got all of Latin America fighting for whale conservation at the Whaling Commission and no longer attached to any of, of the whaling countries. And when uh, we started looking at the scene with sharks, you know, and, and the diving industry, we just realized it was exactly the same with all that is happening in the Pacific, with Pacific small island states taking the lead in protecting sharks because of their importance to their economy through diving. That is something that has to be realized and replicated everywhere. Now, the problem is international treaties do not usually listen to non-extractive users. They listen to the fisheries lobby, to mining companies, to whaling companies, but they don't listen to us down here who are making money and generating jobs out of protecting the marine environment. So we thought, you know, it's time for us to do something. And that's also how Divers for Sharks was started in 2010, to try to interject the economic importance of non-extractive uses of the marine environment and sharks and race into policy making at the international level. Wow, this is this this is amazing. So you you didn't start off with the um, dive industry declaration. You you had your first foray uh, using. Yeah. Your, what did you do? Actually, the way it happened, I um, I was already involved with some of the diving companies in Brazil back in 2010, and then we had the opportunity when the International uh, Convention for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas uh, came to Brazil in 2010. You know. Uh, high seas tuna fishing is one of the uh, main stressors on shark populations because they kill a lot of sharks besides tunas and also albatrosses, sea turtles, other things that get caught on the long legs. So I approached this guy, uh, my partner in Divers for Sharks, uh, Paulo Penguin, who is a living legend in diving in, in, in Brazil. He runs a little dive operation in Rio de Janeiro and he was also running all the local conservation issues and said, you know, why don't we start something directed towards the diving community uh, related to sharks and, and take that to ICAP uh, as a test? And we did that, you know, um, kind of overnight we contacted uh, several people from uh, local uh, dive masters in Brazil to uh, international um, highlights like Peter Hughes and Bill Ecker who helped us put together a little folder uh, with good pictures and good arguments to take it up to um, ICANN. And what we saw there is that government delegates pay so much more attention to you when you're representing a commercial interest instead of just being a conservation NGO. And that encouraged us to move forward. You know, we raised a lot of hell in uh, ICAT. Of course, it takes time at all these international meetings to affect change. But that was a good start. And from there, we... Uh, Moved to CITES uh, in Bangkok uh, a couple of years ago when uh, CITES discussed the shark and manta ray uh, international trade restrictions. We did the same thing. We went around pounding at the chest of government delegates, especially from Latin America and Africa, saying, you know, it's not just a conservation um, issue. You're taking jobs out of our coastal communities. And that's what the dive industry has to do everywhere. You know. We're two volunteer guys down in the backwaters of Brazil. We need more people to do that. We, uh, we really would like the, the big shots in the dive industry to do the same with their own governments. I, I totally agree with you. I totally agree. Now, now when you were, you were bringing this, this first declaration around, this, the non, was it the non-extractive use? Mm -hmm. It was basically saying that uh, people who are are making a living not uh, pulling out of the ocean, they their their interests need to be represented as well, and yes. and so that's what you did. Um, now you, the UN actually gave you a, a a bit of help, didn't they, to to bring you to the dive industry um, yep. declaration? What, um, what did they say? What did, how did they help you? Actually, uh, we, we, we devised this uh, uh, non-extractive declaration, uh, non-extractive businesses declaration to take to the uh, Convention on Biodiversity, uh, which met in um, South Korea a while ago. Uh, they had a conference of the parties there, and that is a UN convention. And also the, the United Nations Environment Program uh, Civil Society uh, Liaison Office helped us spread the word about it. The other thing that happens in this convention is that they do deal about ecotourism uh, to some extent, especially the Biodiversity Convention, but it's 
usually in a kind of negative way. You know, it's about the impact of ecotourism on biodiversity. The whaling commission itself has a whale watching subcommittee that deals with the impacts of whale watching on whales. But no one at this international treaty is seriously talking about the amazing benefits, the billions of dollars that these non-extractive uses generate. So we, uh, we did this declaration, which was signed by a bunch of ecotourism companies, uh, dive uh, uh, shops, uh, hostels, eco-hostels around the world, and took it to the Biodiversity Convention, held a set side event there. And that's also where we liaised with the uh, office of the president of Palau, because they attended our site event there. And we got to learn more about their proposal for the National Marine Sanctuary. And that in turn gave rise to us going to Palau this year with uh, a revised, more focused version of a policy document, which is the dive industry declaration. And how is Palau using your uh, dive industry declaration? What, what, did they, what leg up did they need? Well, uh, you know, Palau is, is a really, really amazing country. It has a lot of commitments to different uh, big superpowers with different interests in the use of marine resources. And yet, through time, they have been able to ensure that their national policy is entirely pro-conservation because it's in their best interest. And uh, the current president, Tony Remendesaw, is just uh, incredible in, in doing exactly that. He retains his ties with all these different countries with different interests, but in the end of the day is the national sovereignty of Palau that demands that their marine environment be protected. So what we did is we, um, we went to Palau this year during Palau Shark Week, which is organized by the, uh, the Palau Shark Foundation, supported mainly by an amazing woman, Tova Bernowski from Fish and Fence Palau, and we, we've been together with them, going to schools, uh, watching their incredible work with the children there, raising awareness about sharks. And also, uh, we took the opportunity to, together with Joe Aitaro from the um, Office of the President, to present to the Minister of um, Tourism of Palau the declaration, which is uh, aimed at all the different international treaties. We uh, intend to take it uh, around uh, to the UN negotiations on high seas conservation, but also we wanted to include their specific support for Palau because they're now proposing to protect 80% of their exclusive economic zone as uh, an off-limits area for industrial fishing, where all marine life is going to be protected, there's going to be an exemption for traditional small-scale fisheries, but that said, and that sets a great precedent for international marine conservation policy. So we're hoping that Palau is going to take this support from global dive industries, more than 120 companies that signed the declaration already, to uh, express to their own parliament, which it, it is a long process from the president. It has to go to the uh, uh, parliament of Palau. It has to be discussed there. There are already some uh, elements that we knew from the wedding scene that are agitating in Palau against conservation. So we want to make sure that uh, people in Palau and policymakers in Palau understand that the whole world that generates billions of dollars in dive income is behind them in protecting their interests and supporting the sanctuary. You just said that um, there's a lot of agitation within the government against conservation? Well, there is a little. You know, uh, the big fishing uh, companies from Asia who dominate your government policies on, on marine resources are very, very good at infiltrating people in uh, small developing countries to agitate against anything that is marine conservation, be it whales, tuna, or marine protected areas. So I've seen that while I was in Palau uh, for this uh, 10, 12 days in March, but still there is great determination in the part of their government to support it, to make it happen. Uh, what has to be shown also to Palauans is that there is good international support for that, and they're, they're not going to be left alone. Palau already has the support of several important international foundations to prepare for the enforcement of this sanctuary. There has to be uh, uh, more of that in terms of the dive industry showing support for Palau. It, it's going to be just like YAP, if they continue to protect their marine life, uh, one of the major international tourism destinations for diving. We have to make sure that they recognize that we're here standing for them 
uh, in the emitter markets and making sure that divers around the world understand if you go to Palau and if the sanctuary is created, you're going to see a protected environment whenever you go. I've been to Palau 10 years ago. I've been to Palau now. If anything, it's just like Yap and some of the other Pacific Islands. It's getting better because of local protection. Wow. I, I guess I'm, I'm shocked that, that, that this hasn't gone through the Palau government yet. What, what is holding back uh, just saying Palau is now a marine sanctuary, 80% is a marine sanctuary. What is stopping yeah. that from happening? Well, it's basically a, a parliamentary process. You know, there is a resolve, uh, there is a lot of determination, but coming from Brazil, you know, I know what the, the political processes are. It doesn't mean it's not going to happen. It just means it has to go through all these different uh, discussions, committees, uh, rituals, if you like, uh, until everyone is satisfied that the due process has been followed and that everyone is properly informed about that. The government itself uh, is doing a lot of uh, uh, public awareness sessions, uh, trying to make people aware of what the sanctuary means, that it's not going to impact on, on their livelihoods negatively, that traditional fisheries are going to be protected. It's just something, an extra protection layer to make sure that the rogue fishing fleets that are raping erosions are not going to be plundering Palau's waters. And it takes, in, in developing countries especially, it takes all this time and all this process to make sure it happens properly. So by signing this declaration, I signed it, I know I, a lot of us signed it, um, and, and I would love to see more people signing it, but by all of us signing this declaration, it shows other governments around the world that people are watching we know what's yep, going absolutely. on. We're watching, and we are we're on the on the side of those uh, who want to conserve things because this is good for business. Yes, and and that I think is is, is the central point. We uh, we sent we launched the declaration in Palau. We sent it over to all the international fisheries treaties. We sent it to UNAP, to the uh, Convention on Biodiversity, CITES, the Convention on Trade in Endangered Species. And uh, we're going to be sending that to the climate change negotiators who are supposed to arrive at a, some sort of agreement later this year. And we also want that uh, as part of the discussion at the UN uh, open-ended uh, sessions on the high seas protection, which are supposed to arrive at an international treaty in 2018 to end this free-for-all in the high seas. You know, nowadays, you have these regional fisheries meetings, but they're highly influenced by the interests of the fisheries lobby and there is no overarching treaty that protects the high seas where most of the uh, pelagic species like uh, some uh, wide-ranging sharks need urgent protection. And um, the declaration basic, basically shows that, you know, we're a lot of businessmen around the world who generate jobs and income for coastal communities. Most of these jobs are generated in the developing world, which desperately needs it. Fisheries and overfishing are already plundering the resources of these communities. So we are offering an alternative to destruction of the marine environment while generating jobs and income. I keep hammering that. You listen to me saying that all the time because that's what we need to do. And the dive industry needs to do that with us. I mean, again, we're two guys down in Brazil with a bunch of volunteers. We need more business. Why isn't the dive industry in the U.S. calling their congressmen and telling them to support the decent climate change agreement? Why aren't people calling everywhere their governments and saying we need more marine protected areas? Calling your uh, parliament, your uh, representative, senator, your president, and doing that everywhere as business people. That's what we need. I mean, it's fine if you keep doing beach cleanups, but there is a limit to that. The dive industry needs to get politically involved in conservation, and that's basically the message we're trying to get across. You know, I th I think what is what has happened is we've uh, the, most of the dive industry is kind of a mom and pop thing. Not all are, but it's mostly mm -hmm. a mom and pop thing. And 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 uh, the the owners are, tend to be quite independent and 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 just just kind of pioneers and out the, out there yep. doing doing their thing. And it's a small industry, and I don't think that uh, we could have possibly realize that we if we just band together we have such a powerful voice even though we think right. of ourselves as just this little this little industry 
We yeah, have a know, huge voice. Just like here, you know, you go to places where you have the national, few national marine parks and reserves in Brazil, and there you have this guy who's been there for 30 years, struggling to keep his dive industry going, for his little dive shop uh, um, operation. And I'm sure it happens everywhere, but people have to realize that they have the power, if it, even if they are isolated individuals, you know. If we could get them all to do stuff, a little stuff, you know, pick up the phone, call the White House, pick up the phone, call your uh, MP in the United Kingdom, um, go to the diet in Japan, say something to uh, the district representative, uh, keep hammering stuff, write to your local media, take part, you know, sign petitions. We have 67,000 followers on our Divers for Sharks Facebook page, and when we put up a petition, not that many people sign on. So people have to realize that they have the power to effect change and they shouldn't be waiting just for the big groups to do that. What do you say to uh, owners, operators that say, listen, I just don't have time for this. I'm really busy. I'm just running day to day to day. Um, and, and many of them don't even know these issues because it's not right in front of their face. It's, it's to the side. What do you say to people um, who are in that position? Well, I'll say you better find time. You better find time to educate yourself about the challenges faced by marine conservation these days. You better find time at least to send an email a day to something related to marine conservation. Because if we don't solve this, you know, horrendous things like climate change, which is not just about the ocean heating up and well, the, the little algae in the coral are going out, that's not a problem. You know, coral are going to dissolve because of the carbon balance in the ocean. It's really horrifying once you get to read a little bit about it, you know? Uh, sharks are disappearing all over the world. Still, uh, it impacts all the marine ecosystem from uh, seagrass to coral reefs. Coral reefs are being degraded because of the lack of sharks, because of all the, the food chain that is not working well anymore and that ends up uh, giving you less healthy coral. So what are you gonna sell to your customers? if you let the marine environment go down the drain. So, you didn't have the time, I'm sorry, you better find it. You better find the time. I, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to do this summit, is just to, to raise awareness of the issues that we're facing, yet we're, we're still doing business as usual with blinders on and yeah. not realizing that there is this elephant in the ocean right in front of and us. I appreciate the challenges that uh, dive shop uh, owners, which are mostly small mom and pop stuff, like you said, I really appreciate the, the challenges they face to keep the business running. But if we don't take, you know, five minutes a day to take care of the bigger picture, we're all going to go down the drain too. Exactly, exactly. I, I cannot believe that we have um, people like you out there uh, doing your darndest to represent our, our best interests uh, at the UN and other really, really important uh, gatherings like CITES. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's just, it, it blew me away when, when I read this. I, I, I just thought, wow, this is initiative. This is, there's a lot of people who complain about you know, we're, our, our industry is not doing enough, and yet it's, it's, it's up to us. It's up to us as individuals yeah, to you know, we, start this. We, we have to find ways of doing it. Uh, we're, we're hoping, we're, you know, it's, it's, it's the middle of the year, and we're almost out of funds already, but one of the things we would like to do this year is find a way of going to the DEMA show and talking to the big shots in the industry. You know, it, it, it can't go on like this, you know, just the volunteers from out there in space trying to do this. We need a more coordinated approach. Uh, there are, you know, industry bodies that have more power and more money and perhaps better location than we do that could help us more. And I, I think it's more of a question of people really realizing the, uh, uh, the importance of this, the urgency of this and the power they have. I, I agree with you. We need to everybody not just people in the industry but everybody needs to be more aware and it and and for me i'm coming across more and more people in our industry who get it that mm -hmm. we have these huge issues that we need to grapple with and we can't ignore them anymore because they're actually completely woven into our business and and right. we now we now must address them but it's best to address them as a a cohesive voice uh, and and people like you helping to lead this lead this charge. How can we support you? How, what can we do 
to help you <laughs> other than pay your way to Dima. <laughs> That's a long list. <laughs> well, I guess that the, that, that the best way to support us is, as I said, to do something yourself, you know, uh, get more information about what's happening with the marine uh, environment around you. Uh, do something, do a little something every day. Uh, join a conservation group. It doesn't have to be us, but it also doesn't have to be one of the big shots that already have millions of dollars, you know. Find a marine conservation group that is really needing help uh, nearest to you and be part of that. And uh, if you want to help divers for sharks, that's great because we're really out of money. I don't know, our operating budget is something around, I don't know, 300 bucks a month or something. And, uh, and, and we spend most of that in, uh, in doing talks uh, to school children, going here and there and uh, doing stuff. Penguin does most of that. And when we have to travel, we, we pass the hat among the very same friends and they help us. Um, as I said, we have 67,000 uh, followers on Facebook and 28 uh, paying membership. So if you want to join us, we have a membership that starts at $1 a month. Uh, just go to Divers for Sharks Facebook page become a Wabagong member for a dollar a month or something, and uh, help us keep going. I uh, think it's worth it just to hear we're, you we're, rant. We're really depressed. We don't have enough money to do all that we need to do. <laughs> but, you know, I think that you're worth it just because of your rant. You do a weekly rant, which I think is just it's just the best. So Yeah, I well, <laughs> I, to be honest with you, I didn't do it this week because I was so pissed off with all the issues that I thought it would go wrong. So I'm... I'm going to be doing the next few days. Yeah, we do a, a weekly shark rant in English uh, every Monday, say Tuesday, uh, whenever we have the time. We didn't have a studio. I don't know how to edit video, so I just take a book of uh, a pile of books and put my, my camera on it and, and do it. And Penguin is, is uh, starting to do that in Portuguese, so uh, we, we reach our different audiences. Uh, basically updating people on what we're doing and talking about some of these uh, main global issues that have to be dealt with. Uh, next week, um, I'm going to a national park. Uh, Penguin is going to do uh, some more school work. Uh, there's uh, students' congresses that we always go, try to talk to biology and oceanography students about conservation issues. So, yeah, that's what we do. We try, we, we try to reach people with a message, and that's what we think that every dive shop should try to do too, you know. The dive courses from the different certifying agencies are fine. They're good for safety. They touch upon the conservation issues, but I don't think they're nearly enough to really create awareness in uh, new divers about the challenges that we face and what each individual can do to help tackle it. I absolutely agree with that. This this is a theme that keeps coming up um, talking to all the other, other speakers in, in the summit, mm -hmm. that uh, we need to go right back to the certification process and make sure oh, yeah. that we are giving this kind of uh, valuable, essential information about what's happening in our environment because we really are supposed to be educators, not just certifiers. Yeah, yeah. We need to create, you know, citizen divers that are aware of their citizenship rights and duties. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to ask you one other thing. Do you believe that every dive operation should? Uh, connect with a, a local or a national uh, conservation agency as part of its business model, just not as a, as a nice thing to do. I do, absolutely. It, 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 it's a survival thing for all of us in the dive industry. You know, without healthy oceans, uh, we have no business, basically. And um, I, I definitely think it has to be part of, of, of the business tissue of, of every operation. You know, you have to find uh, a, a group that represents your interests better. Um, if you want to connect to a, a local backyard group that is more connected to your local um, marine issues, that's great. If you send people out to international travel, you want to help the Palau Conservation Society, the uh, Australian Marine Conservation Society that also does a great job. There's people doing stuff everywhere from Argentina to Vanuatu. And it's not that difficult these days with the internet to find them. And they're all needing help. So I really think it has to be part of the business model. Marine conservation is not a luxury. It's not uh, something that you do because you're a good person. You have to do it because you're a good businessman. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm really looking forward to, to finding out how this whole 
Palau model uh, mm-hmm. gets through the process. Because if we can do this uh, sign on to your to your declaration and have this as a tool to help form and tailor customize policy and focus policy where it's shifted away from the big interest to what is really best in the long term, then right. we can start applying this all over the world to all different types of industries. I'm thinking the cruise line industry that's impacting places like the Caribbean in a very, uh, very negative way. I'm thinking about the coal industry that's impacting Australia and and potential disaster for the Great Barrier Reef. We could apply it over there. There's so many different ways that we could apply this by all coming together and and signing this declaration and then then signing I know I sign petitions all the time I drive everybody crazy but I sign petitions <laughs> I post them I share them so and people who aren't even divers now they they just watch my page and they're going oh we didn't know that was happening oh we didn't know that was happening <laughs> and and it's right. amazing if we just started doing this and sharing it uh, it just ripples out and and the, we, it goes far beyond what the industry um, thinks it can do. It just it does. Again, spreads. people have no idea how important you know a couple of uh, diving nuts can be let loose in an international treaty meeting, just like we did in the uh, CITES. You know, I I really like to think that we made a difference. Uh, you know, Penguin, my my partner was uh, was allowed to speak uh, for the the manta ray international trade restriction proposal, and he spoke. On behalf of, of, of the business, and um, I, I like to think that it changed a few votes and, and, and got it passed, you know, together with uh, many other groups that were there. But we, we're really a, a new thing on, on the block of international conservation treaties, and we have to keep that going. And we have to also be the new kids on the block in the national parliaments everywhere. Uh, people are not used to listen to us, and, and they do listen. I want to know. Actually, I want to. I want to be there when you go to COP twenty one in Paris. You're going, are you? Are you going to do the climate change conference? I don't know. We don't have the funds for that. But you have somebody who's going to represent you. We're we're figuring that out. I mean, <laughs> right now, you know, I I wouldn't like just to tag the declaration to some of the big conservation NGOs because not because they're bad at all. They're great, but just because it's a different perspective. And uh, we're looking at the budget, you know, it, it doesn't look good right now. We would love to go. It's later this year. We still don't know if we're going to have funds. But we're, we're going to make the declaration reach them one way or another. Uh, we're hoping to have a public hearing in Brazil about the national climate change uh, policy. Talk about that there in the Senate. We're trying to find ways. This is this is amazing. It's a it's a puzzle, and and trying to get in when 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 the space is already taken over by these big lobbyists and and uh, you know uh, policymakers that have already made up their mind, and, and so just, it's a it, it's a twenty five hundred dollar ticket yeah. from where we live to um, Paris. You know at that time of the year. So yeah, but it's going to get there one way or another. Even if you 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 can't take it, it's going there. Oh, yeah, no, no, we're gonna we're, we're gonna make sure people hear about this. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Well, your declaration. How can people sign your declaration? What what? Where do we go? What do we do? Oh, uh, we need um, basically company's name, the person responsible for it, and uh, you have to write to uh, info at uh, diversforsharks.com.pr, as in Brazil. That's the info i n f o at uh, diversforsharks.com.br. That's uh, going to our uh, uh, collection of uh, signatures right now. We're going to keep it open uh, as much as we have. Uh, so much more, the better. And uh, yeah, everyone is, is, is welcome to sign. Wonderful. Well, listen, thank you so much for everything. Thank you is not enough. <laughs> it's hey, just not you enough. All. You've been a big supporter uh, of our initiative uh, ever since you guys learned about this. We just hope we had learned about each other earlier, but uh, from now on, uh, let's do more together. And uh, you know, everyone that's uh, watching us, would you please do your part? You know, just not sit there and like stuff on Facebook. Do something. Lift your phone. Uh, support the group. Do your part as the dive industry. We need you. Great way to end this this conversation. Thank you so much. It's just amazing, and we're going to do more, and we're going to get more word out about what's going on because 
we do have a voice in this industry uh, to create change, to shift mindsets and make the world a better place uh, just using just using our businesses. Yep. It's, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to know that this is actually true, that our businesses are hugely impactful. Thanks again, Jose. Great to talk to you. Thank you. Great talking to you too. Bye-bye.